honor for me today. Um, my senior, the executive director of Southern California Teen Challenge, was to have this privilege this morning and uh, be praying for him. He lost a member of his family, and uh, he called me and asked me if I would take this opportunity. And, uh, I, you, know, you know how everybody says, I've always wanted to come and see Biola. I've heard so much about it. And, and to think about a community of believers engaged in study of God's word, engaged in the dreams and, and notions of where God's going to take you, especially all you seniors. You know, what is God going to do with you? And what does that have today to do with our topic? Um, it, I, I read through all your materials. I was here last night in Calvary Chapel and got to hear the speaker, did a great job. And, and my thought was, what could I impart to you that would be any different than what you've heard and, and the basics of what society thinks about in regards to addiction? You know, and I want to say this, I want to qualify this. I've had the privilege of, obviously, since 1974 till now, my first presidential citation in 1990 by George H.W. Bush as one of the top 10 coalition leaders in the country, and then on to serve President Clinton from, you know, 98 all the way through the end of his administration and rolled over into President Bush, three appointments, and then finally into the White House to serve the president directly. When you think of that as a career and a lifetime, I need to give you something to make a little clarity out of this, because what I'd like to do this morning is make my life a case statement, not for the reality of addiction, but for the reality of transformation. In other words, one thing I want to say in qualification, the folks that are out there, they got involved in drugs like I did, it, was, it wasn't on our morning menu. It wasn't something that we thought about doing. We didn't grow up and get born to do that. Now, guarantee yourself, I am well familiar with the societies engaged in this nation and the difficulty some of our young people have growing up in complex communities and, and embedded in drugs from the day of their birth, maybe even born addicted. What I want you to know is that that isn't the course for all folks that do drugs. And, and the dilemma with us asking the questions about why is the answer in seven, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Behold the new, not the past. What is it that God's doing in people's lives? How did the Lord take someone like me I've been an addict for about 11 years, and you know, my mom tells me, don't talk like that anymore. My mom's just, you know, doesn't want her firstborn son giving it all up anymore. You know, my life's like everybody else, and this will be the briefest part of what you hear, just a life of addiction, a life of jail, finally ended up in the federal penitentiary in Terminal Island, a life of absolute misery. Who? in their right mind would want to live that kind of life. Who? Why would, why would you even aspire to be a heroin addict? Why would you dream of crossing the border and getting thrown in jail and finally in prison? Why would you want to hurt your parents that loved you? And mine did. With everything that they could give me, my parents gave me. My folks were esteemed members in the community that I grew up in. I was the firstborn kid. I was going to take over the ranch and be a millionaire like Dad. Why would I leave that destined course of life that I could see clearly in front of me? Why would I opt out of my first year in junior college to stick a needle in my arm? And the end of that portion of that, because the true answer is, why? Is there an enemy? Anybody here know of that? And what's that enemy's task? That enemy's task is to take us into absolute darkness for the balance of our eternity. Um, you know, when I think about what you're doing, uh, Romans 12, you have been besieged, and the beauty of what just happened this morning, by the mercies of this God, what God has done for you, what God has done for me, 
that we present ourselves a living sacrifice. You just did that. For those of you who had that opportunity, that ability this morning to relinquish who you are as a human being and just be thankful that this gracious, almighty God came in, took control this morning, and filled you with something called his presence. What a powerful thing. Now, how in the world does a drug addict coming off the street bump into that reality. You are blessed to be here. And when you graduate as seniors, you will know that exclusively and individually because you'll remember the associations and the friendships and the partnerships and the professors and the theologians. You'll remember everything that they invested in you, everything that they gave you to transform you by the renewing of your mind, by the washing of the word. They gave you that. And every side conversation that you had with a friend, every time you prayed with somebody, every time you came together and invested in another human being for the very sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will remember that. And this was your home. This is where all of that came into being. By the mercies of that God that you present your entire being like you did this morning, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now you have your props and all of those folks to give you the Greek the Hebrew original interpretation, the movement into the New Testament, the Pauline structure of all of that. All I'm gonna tell you is how does a drug addict come from the blitz of darkness to understand that truth? And that's the case statement today. I don't have a clue. How did this God reach into my life when I walked into 20, Teen Challenge, an organization for kids, I thought at 26 years of age, to, to surrender my life, nobody comes into Teen Challenge to surrender their life. We come in like every other person going into a drug treatment program. We've all been in drug treatments before that. We went in just to find out what these folks were doing. Now there must have been some kind of misery that propels you into an organization that you're not commanded to go into. And at 26 years of age as I was, as a married man with two children that were out there as part of my drug industry. How does a man like that walking into an organization like Teen Challenge, how does God Almighty reach inside of that individual and transform them? You know, I, to this very day do not understand that. All I know was it was the first time in my life that I'd ever met another human being on the planet that had been doing drugs longer than I had, that had the same type of heroin addiction, that had been in prison also, that had been clean for over 20 years. I'd never met anybody like that. I didn't even think that was possible. I thought at best I could get my life cleaned up and maybe know something about God, and I'd walk out and I'd keep trying every day of my life. But the Lord God Almighty had no intent for that to be my course. This God drove me to his word. This God drove me to that truth. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly and woman, nor standeth in the... In, blessed is the man that walketh not... Un, <laughs> thank you, Lord, humble me. <laughs> blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in this truth. And in this truth, he meditates day and night. And that person shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, by that gracious God who plants them there. The mystery of all of that transpiring. How does the Lord God keep any of us from what we could become? This truth is my case statement. I don't know of any other thing in my life that could have prevented me from moving forward in this life 
and continued in that path of addiction except God's truth in this word. That's why you're privileged. My gosh, no one understands what you're being given. The latitude, the understanding, the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ Almighty. The understanding that there's a Father that cares for us and loves us and, and is here to bring that transformation in our lives every day. But how does a drug addict or an alcoholic or any other addicted person come to that conclusion? And I'm going to tell you right now, we, by power in ourselves and programming and institutions called rehabilitation, called recovery, have no match for a God that can transform and does every day. And through his word, he transforms. Through his might, he transforms. But this God also does the most incredible. How many seniors in this room right now? And how many of you still asking, God, what are you going to do with me? Where am I going to go? What's the future like? What's that all about? Well, you know, what's going to happen? You've invested all of this in me. Where do I end up? How would an addict like me ever think? Now, I spent 11 years with Teen Challenge. I ended up as was graciously mentioned, to direct the third largest teen challenge way back in the 70s. At that time, Riverside, where these guys came from, it was the third largest teen challenge in the world. Today, Southern California Teen Challenge, you're probably all already aware of, we have over 580 folks inside our ministry today, all over Southern Cal. In the United States of America, over seven, uh, what is it, gosh, I think it's 7,800 are some of the new figures, all across the United States. What are, these, they, what are these folks doing? Are these addicts who are gonna walk out and go back? Maybe, it all depends on them. Are these folks who can change the world? Maybe. How in the world did I end up where I did? Now, let me tell you, I had no intent to ever work for a president. I couldn't even imagine something like that. <laughs> and imagine my, what you might call my FBI jacket. Imagine every conviction. Imagine smuggling heroin. Imagine every county jail, every therapeutic community that I was sent to. Imagine a federal penitentiary rap, two to 10 in a federal pen. Imagine a president appointing me to serve him or her. How does that happen? Here's what you need to know, and I want to share this with you that this gracious God <laughs> that lives in your life, that lives in my life, did this without me knowing about it. How many of you know that if you want to seek an office of that nature, even a voluntary position with any president, you have to pursue that? Just like you're going to do out of, out of your careers right now. Those of you who are seniors are pursuing options and opportunities, and you're praying with all your heart, God, open this door. God, show me what I'm going to do. God, let me get this one. God, help me with that interview. How about when you don't even know it's coming and all of a sudden phone calls start coming from the White House throughout your life asking you if you would be willing to serve the President of the United States of America without you ever putting a foot or a thought into that kind of a path in life. And I, I've just come to figure out that for whatever reason God wanted to use me in the ministry of Teen Challenge was to exemplify to the students in Teen Challenge that this God was great, that this God was the majesty of all things that they could imagine. When I stand up in front of my brothers and sisters in Teen Challenge and share with them, you know what they're thinking? Gosh, could God do that for me? Could my God love me so much that he would move me to be a man in my own household, to be a father to my children, to have a career somewhere, to be blessed, to, to advance, to someday do this, someday do that. And you've already heard the story. For any of you here with Teen Challenge, when the choir was here, you've already heard that there are pastors and graduates from this very incredible institution that are out there ministering in the name of Jesus Christ today, and their backgrounds were no different than mine. This God has the power to transform. And the answer, the only answer I know, and I've been in the positions in the hallways of theory and thought, 
you know, all across this great nation and around this world to use myself as an example that there is a God that can transform us. We have to find ourselves here ready to present ourselves before that can happen. Well, you know, what, what fascinates me is to wake up to the very revelation that you woke up into your class when all of a sudden you understood, but before the foundations of the earth that God had this plan for me, for you. How do you get an ex-heroin addict to understand that? His word has the power to intricately move into us, cutting us under the bone and the marrow and reaching the very being of our soul and spirit and transforming us inside to allow us the privilege to understand his word and see the glory of his light. Why? It's getting close now. Why? Because I want to be ready for this just like you. You see, I don't have the credential. I'm a minister. I'm ordained. I didn't go through a Bible university. I didn't have the privilege to sit at the feet of folks that I admired and class with students that I loved and grow up in that kind of a life. My cause has been that this great God put upon my heart so many years ago to be in his word every day of my life and the journal of that word for my children as a legacy that I could leave my boys to say Pops was in the word every day and every now and then one of my sons asked me, Dad, can I get whatever your last couple of months of study was out of your journal? I just want to study through. I need, a, I, need some, I need some word, Dad. I need some truth. And could you lend me one of your journals, Pops? The beauty of me having a son to ask me that question. The beauty of my boys caring about what dad thinks about. The beauty of my sons growing up, serving the Lord themselves and their grandbabies. The beauty of my father and mother coming to the Lord Jesus Christ because this son walked in. The beauty of my brother under me, another derelict like me. Good family kids, but a derelict like me. Doing drugs, now a double doctorate out of Oxford. You know, a minister and my youngest brother never having to go through that because his older brother went through Teen Challenge and he came at nine years old at my water baptism in Teen Challenge and gave his life to the Lord. Now that's a ripple effect. That's a profound ripple effect. And then my brothers and sisters now have gone out to do their ministry across this globe because this great God destined this young child, this prodigal son, to come home Never forget the truth in that story. In, in that incredible verse when it says that he came to his senses and said, even my father's servants have bread to eat, no one comes to their senses. And that's the case statement for this morning. Unless the Spirit of God himself comes and draws you, to the Son, to the Father. No one comes to that. The beauty that you have being here and the beauty that you're going to have in life is the same beauty that I've had in my life to watch this glorious God open doors that I couldn't imagine, cause me to do things that I had no understanding I was even capable of doing, to be here this morning and share with you Church, your day's in front of you and it exists even now as you sit right there because the beauty of this truth is the beauty of a God who has set us free and wants us to be that advocate, that ambassador, that, that one that's out there in the field of reconciliation to others, even here, and have pity on those by words of affirmation and concern and love, they just don't see that truth the way you do.
That has been the destiny of wars on this planet, the rage of mankind to separate us, not unify us, to keep us in the dark and not build us as a body of Christ. This day's at hand, church, And what's at hand is the time that we come together. Part of my closing is this, that I have, I've been in privileged positions. Uh, The opportunity that was given to me uh, to be deputy assistant to the President of the United States and executive order office means that I had the privilege to serve the President directly. There was nobody between the President and myself. When he wanted to meet me, he called me into the Oval Office. The executive chiefs of staff came in to hear what the President was gonna talk to me about. I always felt like, wow, imagine that. The chiefs of staff got to come in to hear what the president wants to tell me. In any other setting, I don't care if you're cabinet or who, you've got to go through the domestic policy council to get a meeting with the president of the United States, and then the chiefs of staff have to read your script and understand what you're going to tell the president, and then you sit in the Oval Office with the president of the United States, and you have your script that you follow. When the president of the United States called me, it was his script. All I did was say yes, sir, and no, sir. Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Can we do this? Can we do that? The privilege and the honor of sitting in that kind of position was mind-boggling. What I know about that time was that it was for a purpose in my life today. I just left in closing. I was an executive director of a global foundation out of the White House, doing stuff all over the world, traveling. My job was to create the first faith-based foundation in the world, that being of every stripe and creed. And the executive director, me, was the son of God. And we had every other tradition in that foundation. And we were going to prove a purpose, that we could work together upon this planet, even though we had differing creeds and ideologies and premises of life and faith. And for years, I had the privilege of serving in that directorate. And the one thing I know is that I was there on purpose again, because every time we got to share the truth of what we believed, This great God did what he's always done for me, shared within my heart that moment of truth and that moment of scripture to give to them as they gave to me. The beauty of the life that's before us has always been couched in love. Your mission is the same mission I have, and that's why I say it's an honor to be here, church, because my mission is to do what you're being called to do and what you're doing right now, to serve one another, to serve our neighbor. And let me close with this. That may have been a colloquial in the time that it was written, but today a neighbor is anybody on this planet. There is no separation anymore. The medium of electronics and media has provided for us the opportunity to reach out to anybody in the world at the touch of a mobile device. And my point about that is we are now as a global society responsible to every neighbor in this planet. Your life has to be exemplified as my life is exemplified in this truth, that our life is to present ourselves every day as a living sacrifice to this great God that he might be there in such power and force, present himself as a declaration through us to others, all neighbors. And when you get to be my age as a grandpa with grandchildren to your grandbabies, that someday those children that you will raise, that I have raised, actually admire and want to be around their dad, bring their grandbabies to my house and invite me over to theirs, that I might be the father of the faith that started all of them. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.